It's time for us to get more analysis to understand what this means, not just the figures. And I'm being joined by the right person. He's a development economist and public affairs analyst, Professor Ken Ife. Uh, Prof, uh, finally, we have seen what the Central Bank of Nor highlighted and listened, uh, talking about tightening uh, the positives and the negatives, loosening, identifying what that would also mean for us as a country, and finally, retention, which they believe that will consolidate on the achievements of what we have had so far. What's your reaction to this? I think the analysis um, is quite robust because the CBN at this moment has so many balls in the air around um, driving down inflation and then of course mainly to the uh, money supply issues and, and uh, uh, tackling the foreign exchange side of it and then pushing on food production because the food stock basket index is the, is the biggest driver among the structural factors. So it is doing quite a bit. And, um, and they felt that the growth and the recovery are both fragile. And if we have so many balls in the air tackling this issue, that it will be like jumping the gun to, to begin to tighten. Uh, so they, they rather will have things stay as they are for now. To, to watch how uh, it was a balanced review of what the the ramifications of the the the, the normalization of monetary policies in the West, the rising inflation in the West, and measures to contain those, and the possible impact that they could have on our uh, foreign portfolio investment inflows, and all of that. But they just balanced the risk to in favor of um, holding the parameters and having less ball in the air and seeing how the how the those parameters move uh, going forward and the impact they will have i mean they they were aware of the uptick in inflation and of course that was easy to explain away because of the the accelerated demand in the uh, christmas uh, festivities on food in particular and of course some other items like alcohol and all of that so i think in on balance then it was is a, a, a reasonable decision uh, and i think it would be wrong to hurt the economy that is recovering and growing and uh, and there's so much uh, impact of water variables on on the on the economic growth prof are you also optimistic uh the cbn governor is talking about consolidating yes which we've uh, highlighted but looking at food inflation he says all of the efforts, particularly regards to the interventions, uh, that in the short to long term will start to see the positives of this. Do you see all of this impacting generally on the growth? Because the fragility of this growth is what everyone is bothered about. And uh, COVID, one way or the other, is still scary, you know, when we look at the figures coming, especially from the global space. Well, the, the COVID is not is the least of our problem right now because as a population, we are learning to live with COVID. And two, we don't envisage a situation where we would have um, a, to lock down our economic system. Uh, nobody talks about that. I don't think, I, I don't even think it's on the table. So, and even though we are, we are among the poorest in terms of the vaccination rates, but that notwithstanding, Many many aspects of our economy are adjusting to that reality, and uh, and in terms of uh, look for example, last week we saw the rice pyramid, and over one million metric tons displayed in Abuja. All these are paddies. These paddies are going to be released immediately for them to be milled, uh, and then of course that will head into the market. That is not just Abuja; it's going to be launched in virtually many states of the federation. So you will see in the in the mm -hmm. immediate term, in the near term, a huge releases of maize and rice, and that would uh, obviously impact on uh, on food uh, sub inflation index, which has been the bigger driver of all in the all the five uh, in inflation indices. 
Mo mo moving on, I, I also remember talking about interventions, staying with interventions because the impact of these interventions are quite notable. Are uh, looking at what we've seen uh, in some time now. The hundred for hundred policy also of the central bank. I I'm kind of worried, and experts have also talked about this. That what do you think about CBN funding and sustaining all of this? Oh, paying back is also something that is worrisome. We know what happened. We had some stories even about the Ankobora scheme of some farmers not being able to pay back to the central bank. Now, the 100 for 100 is actually a good news and is a game changer in, the res in respect to the fact that here you had a successful Anko Borowas program that have revolutionized our agricultural production system and now put the farmers on the driving seat with nearly 4 million of them receiving uh, loans without collateral. So that is a fundamental shift and it is commercial farming which, which, which is being integrated to national and global supply chain. Now the next phase is to bring in a major trust on the manufacturing uh, and value addition which is what 100, 100 for 100 is. So it's coming there to actually push both forward and backward linkages. In other words, take a lot of this growing capacity at the process at the production side and then transform it and ready for both meeting um domestic production and then also meeting export requirements so that is a necessary bridge that needs to be built so that you can have a sensible balance between the three primary components of our gdp which is the agriculture um, industry and services so it is so so critical and that's where you begin to think about how do we increase foreign exchange and then how do we reduce the importation bill all of those are going to be answered by this 100 for 100 and i'm glad it is popular when 224 have applied for it we are looking for less than 50 percent of these people for the next three months so it is already posting a success and they're asking for 234 billion which is not even uh, as much as what is expected because we are looking at about five billion dollars per per project. So as as a, as as a maximum said, for for, said, for that. Said, but if you do have projects that are much much bigger than that, then of course the board of the CBM will have to look at that. So they don't rule anything out. So it's, it's a sign of um, uh, you know interest, great interest to manufacturers. Now coming to the credit side of it, yeah, I know that some of the farmers, the one farmer one hectare have been a bit sluggish in the repayment of their loan. But I have to tell you this. Anybody who doesn't repay the loan has not actually applied the loan in agricultural production. That I have to tell you. Because when you look at the economics of production of any of the crops, I've seen all of those, and I, I'm, I'm very, well. You know, if you look at the economics of production of each of these crops, whether it's rice or maize or cotton, the input cost comes to about 25 to 30%. So there's a huge margin of profit, not less than 50%. So if you see a farmer that actually planted, then one, one, one ton of your maize or 1.5 ton will pay for your loan. But some of them are getting five tons per hectare. So, so it's just whoever they didn't pay, it's not because they didn't uh, get the money. They just didn't plant anything. So those who planted and harvested, cannot give you the excuse of there is a, a, a flood and all that because they were all insured. 2% of their of their loan went to insurance. So there is a cover to pay for any any distance. So and there's a lot of risk mitigation instrument being applied to that lending. So that's why they're not even bringing the collateral in the first place. So we don't don't buy those stories. So what will happen is this when they will get into serious enforcement, they already have a global standing instruction. They will start sweeping the account. Of the of the farmer in any bank that they have an account or any guarantor that they use, they'll start sweeping. But having said that, though, we the, the repayment of the loan from prime anchors is over 90 percent. That is the big private sector that are borrowing substantially. Their repayment is over 90 percent. So this program is successful. And I know that the hundred for hundred would even be more successful because they are going to be plugging into the production capacity of the, the, the likes of the Anko Borowas program. So they will have raw materials from Nigeria and it's designed for them to utilize at least 50% of the raw materials in Nigeria and to focus on local employment of over 80% of their employment. 
So that is the last piece of the jigsaw. And I'm very, very confident that they will all add up. Prof, I, I'm very interested in the, um, the aspect of subsidy that the governor of Central Bank talked about because we're expecting that that would happen anytime soon and we're thinking of what the impact will be definitely on inflation and all of that. But the Central Bank governor is also saying that this needs to be done strategically, like trying to uh, alleviate the sufferings of Nigerians because obviously we know transport fear and all of that, price of food stuff and all of that will be on the high side if this happens. Uh, what is your reaction to uh, the talks around subsidy around this time as we try to grow our economy? I, for one, am patently opposed to subsidy, especially at the level of consumption. What you subsidize is production. Especially, I mean, you go to Europe, they continue to subsidize their farmers. That anything you talk about, bringing it into the negotiation, they won't agree. So if you subsidize farmers, fine. That's where you need to put your money. If you subsidize, you don't even need to subsidize modular refineries. All you need is to loan them money. They will pay it back, so there's no subsidy going there. So. The law, the new revised PIA, has re requested that this does take place on a certain timeline. But it is now uh, considered that that timeline is unrealistic. Because even my advice to government, at various levels of government, I have said that they need to have wider consultation. A wider consultation among the strategic stakeholders, which are federal, state, and local government, and all these things. Then they'll come out again and have a second level consultation with the industry, the labor, the current producers, the oil marketers, the Dangote refinery, and all of that. So that you can see a declaration of capacities and see the build up of recovery from the our government owned refineries, see the build up, how they intend to build up capacity from their from their maintenance and how uh, uh, Dangote plans to build up capacity. And then you see how you phase. You phase the reduction against the increase in capacity so that you don't have any, any gap. So, but that kind of thing can trigger when you have had exhaustive consultation with all the layers. Otherwise, um, you're going to have a, a real fallout that will not be very pleasant in an election year. So I'm glad that they have commenced that those consultations with intensity and that they are allaying the fears of uh, marketers and the public that is going to happen overnight. Uh, so the hoarding, hoarding will stop and panic buying will stop. So that is, that's very important. Why the real discussion takes place and we know what we are doing. I'm not personally happy about putting one day when you say the price will rise from 160 to 400. I don't want to have that. You need to do this in a very phased and sustainable manner so that um, you know everybody knows what to expect. Everybody agrees on a timeline and they build up and build down of capacities, and then see how it goes. Hmm. And um, be, uh, before I talk about the monetary and the fiscal side, of course, uh, fiscal side complementing more of the efforts on the monetary side. I'm also looking at Forex, which is also the big elephant uh, in the cupboard. And we talked about, um, the governor identified diaspora remittances as a little bit of um, improvement. So well, what more incentives, what more can be done uh, to improve, uh, you know, to stimulate remittances from uh, uh, abroad? Well, you know, there, there are talks now um, of um, some remittance uh, trust fund or something. That there's still more talk now on, on that area uh, in, from investment point of view. So I think that is a big one because you will, the, the diaspora will be keen to engage in that process. And the IMTOs, international money transfers, I think I should like government to, to maybe add 1%. Um, or demand 0.5 to 1 percent of their commission to go to the to that fund that uh, in diaspora investment fund as well as find other ways and means of building up that fund because that fund will now come handy to fund infrastructure to fund education to fund health to fund private sector intervention in many of these areas in agriculture and find those areas where the diaspora will connect because so that they are putting their money there, they expect that all the industrial area that they will connect to will be there. So this that will be very, very handy and very, very helpful. So, so that's that. But I also think that if you look at the spending plan of government in the, the borrowing plan, they're looking to borrow 2.57 trillion from domestic sources 
2.57 trillion from external uh, sources and then 1.16 trillion from bilateral and multilateral loans. I would, I would suggest that government borrows more from the domestic side than from the foreign. But of course, if the NNPC is not sending their money to central bank, because they normally should be sending about $3 billion a month, nothing came in the whole of last year. If something was to be going, then it will reduce the pressure on government borrowing um, externally as, a, as one of the ways of giving uh, dollars to the bank, you know, for the to central bank. So that's one of the sources of, of, of dollars, because we do have commitments to uh, external servicing of uh, foreign uh, dollar-denominated loans. So we will still have to have channels that send money there. Diaspora is one of them. Um, so, you know, but otherwise, under normal circumstances, if a lot more borrowing is done internally, what it will be, and you give them a, a reasonable rate, then the, if what it will mean is that you now use that to begin to mop up excess liquidity in the country and the economy right now. Because there is a lot of money, money in the system uh, fighting COVID, money from fiscal and monetary authorities, a lot of them are in circulation uh, fighting COVID. So we need to begin to take a lot of say, some of this money out um, and using the treasury bills, offering a, a, a good rates that would interest even the foreign investors. The foreign portfolio investors will come if you are having a reasonable uh, rate of um, or yield on those securities. So you begin to use that to mop up the liquidity because we're in an election year where even more money will come into circulation from politicians. And some of these politicians, I hope they can bring their money from in dollars because that will help us a lot. If they can bring some of those monies they have in Switzerland and wherever they have them, bring them into the country for elections, then we can have some of those monies um, accrete to the foreign reserves. But of course, the oil is very promising in terms of uh, uh, higher prices. Uh, so, so, you know, on balance, we're going to have a, a better year this year than last year in terms of growth and recovery. Hmm. Well, wrapping this up now, uh, just staying with the fact that it's an election year and everyone is worried, talking about spending, what the effect might be on the economy and all of that. We've seen the central bank again talking about uh, creative sector, agri sector, pharmaceutical sector and all of that. And with all of this support and intervention, the fiscal side has a role to play. Do you see the fiscal side giving that support that is needed at this time uh, as we move to 2023? No, the fiscal side is trying, to be honest with you, because what the fiscal side has done has not been done before. Hmm. Every year they bring in Finance Act to smoothen the edges, to constantly be reviewed and plugging the holes. Every year they start the budget at January to, to, to December. And even this year they've allowed another three months till March for the expenditure of last year to continue. What is continuing till March is not revenue expenditure, it's not uh, uh, salaries, because they paid all the salaries. These are capital expenditures that are giving us even more opportunity to create more jobs and to add to growth in the economy. So investment is everything. It's an investment that creates the economic activity, which creates the jobs and disposable income, then people can buy education and health and sustainably reduce poverty. So the, 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 I can't afford the fiscal side. Fiscal side is working extremely hard and hand in gloves with both the National Assembly and also with the monetary authorities. We've not had this level of coordination between the two uh, authorities, fiscal and monetary, uh, irrespective of what any people say. The critics will always say something, but where's the evidence? The evidence is that they're working well, working together. They both tackled uh, COVID decisively and sent it away within one quarter. Unlike in two, 2017, everybody was everywhere. And they took three, three uh, how many, how many quarters? It took about five quarters before we could come out of it. But this is not the same. There is a different regime. Hmm. Well, it's a good way uh, to leave it. Discussions definitely will continue around this decision. That's much time can take. I've been speaking to uh, development economist and public affairs analyst, our own professor, uh, Ken Ife. Prof, thank you so much for joining us to analyze uh, the resolutions immediately uh, as we got it live from Abuja, the CBN headquarters. We appreciate this. Thank you very much. 
All right, there. Well, before we go, let's just tell you that the market is closing positive today uh, with the index up 0.02%. Top gainers, we have Kotva, we have ETI, Academy, uh, Press, and we have Champion, Regalinks, Top Losers, Siena, Lizin, Prestige, Insurance, uh, we have um, Cheap PLC, Conest, M Benefit. Indeed, that's our show uh, today. Thank you very much for watching. It's a different one because it's the first MPC meeting uh, for the year. Uh, we needed to follow proceedings and bring you up to speed with, to make sense of uh, the figures that were reeled out about the Central Bank of North. Thank you so much. I'll see you tomorrow. And of course, the discussion around the world of business continues. Stay safe.